Hello, and welcome to this presentation on the effective use of the code. The purpose of this presentation is to introduce the general purpose and reasoning to building codes, their basis, development, implementation, and enforcement. This program is good for anyone who has an interest in how building construction is regulated in the United States. We hope that this course will show you the often unseen processes of building codes that contribute so much to the safety of the buildings that we construct and occupy. Not just here in the U.S., but around the world, code officials recognize the need for modern, up-to-date residential codes that address the design and construction of one- and two-family dwellings and townhouses. The International Residential Code, or IRC, is designed to meet the needs of those in the build environment through model code regulations that protect the public health and safety in all communities. Though the IRC is a standalone codebook, which establishes minimum regulations for one- and two-family dwellings and townhouses using prescriptive provisions, it was founded on the principles that make possible the use of new materials, new building designs, and new construction methods. The IRC is also fully compatible with all international codes, or I-codes, published by the International Code Council, the ICC. Some of these International Code Council publications include the International Building Code, the International Energy Conservation Code, the International Existing Building Code, the International Fire Code, the International Fuel Gas Code, and others. Now, the International Residential Code does provide many benefits to designers, builders, and homeowners. But one of the largest benefits of the process is the creation of the Forum for Residential Construction Professionals to discuss prescriptive code requirements. This forum is open to all construction professionals and provides an arena to debate, propose, and write code provisions. These model codes also provide international consistency in the application of various provisions. With this background, let's move on to the development of the IRC. The first edition of the International Residential Code was issued in the year 2000. It was the result of an effort, which began in 1996, by a development committee approved by the ICC. This development committee consisted of representatives from the three statutory members of the International Code Council at that time. These code councils consisted of the Building Officials and Code Administration, or VOCA, the International Conference of Building Officials, or ICBO, and the Southern Building Code Congress International, or SBCCI, as well as representatives from the National Association of Home Builders, or NAHB. The purpose was to draft a standalone residential codebook which would be consistent and inclusive of the scope of the existing model codes. Technical content of the 1998 International One- and Two-Family Dwelling Code and the latest model codes promulgated by BOCA, ICBO, SBCCI, and ICC were used as the basis for the development of this book. To complete the International Residential Code, public hearings were held in 1998 and 1999 to consider all proposed changes from the industry. The current International Residential Code represents changes developed through the years by various development committees and their open and transparent process. A new edition is established every three years. It's also worth noting that the IRC works directly with other industry professionals to establish consistent code throughout various organizations. As an example, Residential electrical code provisions are based on the National Electrical Code. Energy provisions, which are established in Chapter 11, are duplicated directly from the International Energy Conservation Code, or IECC. And fuel and gas provisions have been included based upon input, information, and an agreement with the American Gas Association, also known as the AGA. It is also important to note that the IRC is intended to provide and establish provisions consistent with the code that adequately protects public health, safety, and well-being. It is not the intent of the code to promote specific products or practices, nor is it the intent to restrict the use of new materials, methods, or systems. Lastly, 
the International Residential Code is maintained through the review of proposed changes, which are submitted by code officials, industry professionals, design professionals, and any other interested party. Proposed changes are carefully reviewed and considered through the open code development process, in which all interested parties may participate. Now let's take a moment to discuss the actual code committees. Code committees will listen to and consider proposed changes to the code at various committee action hearings, also called CAH. These committees are as follows. RB is the code for the IRC, Building Code Development Committee. RE is the code for the Residential Energy Code Development Committee. And RMP is the code for the IRC, Mechanical Plumbing Code Development Committee. The Residential Energy Committee is also responsible for the residential provisions of the IECC, or International Energy Conservation Code. Dates are established as part of the code review process where interested parties may submit their code change recommendations and proposals. These dates are established in each International Residential Code Book and are tentative in nature. To better understand the code book, marginal markings are made throughout. A solid vertical line in the margins within the body of the code indicates a technical change from the previously issued code book. An arrow indicates a deletion. This means an entire section, paragraph, exception, or table has been deleted, or an item in a list of items, or an item in a table has been deleted. A single asterisk placed in the margin indicates that text or a table has been relocated within the code, while a double asterisk placed in the margin indicates that the text or table immediately following the double asterisk has been relocated there from elsewhere in the code. Each codebook typically has a table of location changes within the introduction of the codebook. It is also worth noting that certain terms established in Chapter 2, definitions, are italicized where they appear in code text. These terms are not italicized where the definition in Chapter 2 does not impart the intended meaning in the use of the term. The terms selected have definitions that the user should read carefully to better understand the code. So now, let's discuss the actual chapters and parts of the International Residential Code. First, it is important to understand that the IRC covers what is considered conventional and common practices in residential construction. It is unique that much of the IRC, including chapters 3 through 9, as well as chapters 34 through 43, are laid out in an orderly format that is consistent with the normal progression of construction. In other words, it starts with the design phase and continues through the final trim-out phase of residential construction. This is consistent with the overall philosophy of IRC. In other words, think of the IRC as a recipe. It tells you exactly what is required for various phases of construction. Now, the IRC consists of 44 chapters and appendices A through O. To better understand the International Residential Code, it is further broken down into nine parts. Part 1 is administrative. This consists of Chapter 1, Scope and Administration. This chapter is broken down into two sections. The first section is Scope and Application, and the second section is Administration and Enforcement. Part 2 of the IRC is Definitions. This section consists of Chapter 2 Definitions. In this chapter, we will find the italicized terms previously discussed. Part 3 is Building, Planning, and Construction. This section consists of Chapters 3 through 10, and it includes Chapter 3, Building Planning, Chapter 4, Foundations, Chapter 5, Floors, Chapter 6, Wall Construction, Chapter 7, Wall Covering, Chapter 8, Roof and Ceiling, Chapter 9, Roof Assemblies, and Chapter 10, Chimneys and Fireplaces. Part 4 is Energy Conservation. This section covers Chapter 11, Energy Efficiency. This section is the responsibility of the Residential Energy Committee and comes directly from the International Energy Conservation Code. 
Part 5 is mechanical. It covers chapters 12 through 23. This includes Chapter 12, Mechanical Administration. Chapter 13, General Mechanical System Requirements. Chapter 14, Heating and Cooling Equipment and Appliances. Chapter 15, Exhaust Systems. Chapter 16, Duct Systems. Chapter 17, Combustion Air. Chapter 18, Chimneys and Vents. Chapter 19, Special Appliances, Equipment, and Systems. Chapter 20, Boilers and Water Heaters. Chapter 21, Hydronic Piping. Chapter 22, Special Piping and Storage Systems. Chapter 23, Solar Thermal. Part 6 is Fuel Gas. It consists of Chapter 24, Fuel Gas. This chapter regulates the design and installation of fuel gas distribution systems, appliances, appliance venting systems, and combustion air provisions. The definition of fuel gas includes natural gas, liquefied gas, petroleum, manufactured gases, and mixtures of these gases. Part 7 is Plumbing. It covers chapters 25 through 33. These chapters cover Plumbing and Plumbing Administration, which includes Chapter 25, Plumbing Administration, Chapter 26, General Plumbing Requirements, Chapter 27, Plumbing Fixtures, Chapter 28, Water Heaters, Chapter 29, Water Supply and Distribution, Chapter 30, Sanitary Drainage, Chapter 31, Vents, Chapter 32, Traps. Chapter 33, Storm Drainage. And let's take a moment to point out the uniqueness of Chapter 26, General Plumbing Requirements. It is worth noting that this chapter is often referred to as miscellaneous rather than general plumbing requirements. This is because this is the only chapter that requirements of the code are not interrelated. In other words, if some plumbing requirements cannot be located in one of the other sections of the code, they can be found here in Chapter 26. Part 8 is Electrical. It covers Chapters 34 through 43. These chapters include Chapter 34, General Requirements. Chapter 35, Electrical Definitions. Chapter 36, Services. Chapter 37, Branch Circuit and Feeder Requirements. Chapter 38, Wiring Methods. Chapter 39, Power and Lighting. Chapter 40, Devices and Luminarias. Chapter 41, Appliance Installation. Chapter 42, Swimming Pools. Chapter 43, Class II Remote Control, Signaling and Power Limited Circuits. And finally, we must give Part 9 its due. It is References and consists of Chapter 44, Reference Standards, as well as all of the appendices, A through O. So, here are going to be some of the questions that we hope to answer in this segment. What is a building code? Why do we have building codes? Who is responsible for building codes and their enforcement? What is a model code? And how is a model code developed? Can you get involved in writing the code? The regulation of the construction industry is unique in the United States, and even unique compared to other countries. It can be a mystery to those not involved in our industry, and sometimes even a mystery discipline to discipline. It is not uncommon for somebody to have a complete understanding of code within their discipline, but they have never thought about or found any interest in the big picture. But it is important to understand how these codes are created and regulated. First, let's start by defining building codes and their overall purpose. The term code means a collection of requirements that pertain to a specific subject and regulate specific practices. So, building codes are a collection of requirements that pertain to buildings. Now, the formal definition is a collection of laws, regulations, ordinances, or other statutory requirements adopted by a government legislative authority, 
involved with the physical structure and healthful conditions of buildings and building sites. The primary application of these rules is to regulate new or proposed construction. Building codes set formal rules for things such as the design of buildings, the way buildings are to be built, the materials used to construct the buildings, and, just as important, the overall performance of buildings. Now, the core family of building codes consists of the building code, which covers the structure itself, a plumbing code, mechanical code, and electrical code. In some locations, this group of codes is known as the building code for that location. But there are many other building codes beyond these four. So why do we need building codes? The purposes of the rules and regulations in the building code focuses entirely on health and safety. Building codes intend to provide, at a minimum, the health, safety, and comfort of the individuals who occupy the buildings. Code addresses many hazards, such as structural failure, fire, storms, wind damage, flooding, earthquakes, rot and decay, electrocution, dangerous fumes and gases, drinking water contamination, and much more. A key point is that building codes are the minimum requirements for a building. If you were to build a building strictly to the code, it does not guarantee a high-quality, durable building. The code only seeks to ensure that the building is safe. Someone once said, the code is the worst you can build a building by law. Think about that. Code is the worst you can build a building by law. But we have to remember, homeowners, building owners, and occupants of these homes and buildings expect buildings to be safer, have greater durability, and have greater performance than the building code dictates. Therefore, in many cases, building to the code is simply not enough. And this leads us to a fundamental question. Why have the building code at all? Why do jurisdictions dictate to property owners what can and cannot be built on their own property? Well, there are many reasons. The first is public safety. Building safety and construction impacts many people beyond the building owner. Whether it be the occupants of the building, individuals who may live near the building, impact on public services such as water supply and basic building services, the general public does have a stake in the construction of a new building. Building codes also ensure the provision of public services. Cities and towns provide emergency services such as police protection and fire protection. And therefore, provisions must be made to ensure maximum efficiency for our first responders. Building codes ensure accessibility and equal access for all. On the other side of this, those with disabilities. People with disabilities should be allowed to access any building, regardless of their disability, within reason. And needless to say, it is this within reason that becomes a sticking point in construction. As you can imagine, within reason is pretty ambiguous. The code, as we'll discuss later, tries to be as unambiguous as possible. Another reason that we have building codes is insurance. In order to provide insurance of a property at a reasonable rate, insurance companies rely on the building code and have confidence that the building has been constructed to a certain standard. Also, buildings have a very long life. Buildings are bought and sold several times throughout their life, and the purchaser of those buildings has to have confidence that the building was constructed safely and properly, since many of the features of the building are hidden and, therefore, impossible to inspect when purchasing. Codes also exist due to the complexity of buildings. Even if an owner wants to have a building constructed safely and put into service safely, Many owners simply do not have the expertise to ensure the level of safety they desire. These are just some of the reasons that various jurisdictions impose building codes. But ultimately, the extent to which building codes will be implemented and enforced comes down to the local level. Besides the core benefits of protecting life, health, and safety, building codes provide many other benefits to building owners. 
the building industry, and the general public and society as a whole. Building codes provide uniformity of building practice. As an example, with the building code training becomes easier because in many cases you are training to the code. This reduces construction costs. Just imagine if you had to create a training program for your apprentices with no code and no final goal in mind. It would be virtually impossible. And if it were possible, it would cost a fortune. The code also levels the playing field for contractors, ensuring that all construction meet a minimum construction standard. Building codes, and more specifically zoning laws, ensure that the structure has the appropriate interface with the surrounding buildings and the site. Some examples of this would be stormwater runoff, fire spread, noise, backflow prevention, water and sewer, and other public systems. Building codes also contribute to a safe work environment for construction workers and facility and maintenance personnel. And building codes contribute to a community's well-being and quality of life. Codes and local ordinances can make a specific community a much more desirable location to raise your family, open a business, or just to visit. So, with this background, let's now talk about when do building codes apply. We all know that building codes will apply to new homes and buildings, but they also apply when an existing home or building is remodeled, added to, or renovated. Each of these situations require that a building permit is obtained. Once a permit is obtained, this invokes the building code. Now, for new buildings, there is little to no confusion. The entire building must be constructed to the existing code for that location and for that type of building. However, for existing buildings, the code can get more complicated. When an addition is constructed to an existing building, the addition must be constructed to the code. But unaffected or unchanged portions of the building are typically not affected by the building code. The same is true for renovations and alterations. Typically, only the areas being renovated or altered have to be completed to the code. There are, however, some instances where existing buildings will be affected by the code, even when the renovation or alteration is not planned. A good example of this is if the building or home is going to be sold. As an example, many jurisdictions, especially in Massachusetts, require that smoke alarms, carbon monoxide alarms, and ground fault interruption connectors be brought up to the current code before the building can be sold. Also, some jurisdictions have adopted maintenance codes. This is becoming popular because people are living in homes where maintenance is being provided for them. The ICC now has the IPMC, the International Property Maintenance Code. Where adopted, the IPMC provides for continued use and maintenance of plumbing, mechanical, electrical, and fire protection systems in existing residential and non-residential structures. These codes may require upgrades even when there is no renovation, repair, or alteration of the existing buildings that would trigger the need for permit. Now again, it is critical to mention that the codes do change based on location, in many cases right down to the neighborhood, and this leads us to who is responsible for the building codes. In the entire U.S., the answer to who is responsible for the building codes is not always clear, but unlike other countries, Building codes are not dictated by the federal government for the entire country. Instead, the states hold that power and have never relinquished it to the federal government. Now, believe it or not, this is accomplished through the Tenth Amendment to the Constitution, often referred to as Police Powers Amendment, or Amendment 10. This amendment was signed into law on December 15, 1791, and it states, any powers not specifically given to the federal government through the Constitution shall remain with the states and the people. However, there are exceptions. When the federal government funds the construction, they will obviously have a say in the codes. A good example of this is facilities construction by House and Urban Development, or HUD, or in the case of manufactured housing. Because these buildings are manufactured in a central location and then transported throughout the country, they must meet a code set by Housing and Urban Development. 
These buildings aid in interstate commerce and are the responsibility of the federal government. But even here, states have a say in the code. As an example, Massachusetts 780 CMR 110.R3 is manufactured buildings. It is noted that this provision is unique to Massachusetts. Listed for 110.R3.1.2 is scope. It states, 780 CMR 110.R3 shall govern the design, manufacturing, handling, storage, transportation, relocation, and installation of manufactured buildings, manufactured building components, and modular homes, and hereinafter be referred to as product intended for installation in the Commonwealth and or manufactured in the Commonwealth for shipment to any other state in which such product and the labels thereon are accepted. Subject to the local zoning ordinances and bylaws, product may be sold for, delivered to, or installed on building sites located in any location in the Commonwealth if such products have been approved and certified pursuant to 780-CMR-110.R3. Here, the state is establishing their code for manufactured buildings and homes. However, the federal government also wants to have a say in local building codes. They do this through requirements for accessibility through the Americans with Disabilities Act, or ADA, or worker safety regulations, which are regulated through OSHA. The federal government also influences building code development through federal funding by tying it to the amount of federal building codes adopted. The various states adopt building codes differently. So, who is responsible for adopting building codes at the state level? Again, it varies. Even though every state has the right to establish their own building codes, how this is done varies widely state to state. The simplest states simply establish a code and apply it throughout the entire state. But some states allow various localities, counties, cities, towns, parishes to establish their own code, while other states do not permit any changes. For those states that do allow changes, there is typically a process where they have to show the state that their code is no less stringent than the code which has been established at the state level. Other states often use an approach which is known as home rule. In this situation, the responsibility to establish code is further delegated down to the local level. In this case, states require local towns and cities to establish a code, while other states leave it up to the city or town as to whether or not they want to establish a code at all. And again, this responsibility varies widely. In most cases, a city or county is not required to adopt a local code they must at least adopt the IBC, IRC, etc. And almost all states require that the state code be implemented for any state-funded buildings or partially funded buildings. Now, just to demonstrate the differences, let's take a look at a few states, Florida, Arizona, and Massachusetts. Florida had adopted a state minimum building code in 1974 which required all local jurisdictions to adopt and enforce a code that would ensure minimum standards. This would be a home rule standard. But after Hurricane Andrew hit in 1992, it revealed the deficiencies of the state building code. Hurricane Andrew created the greatest insurance crisis in Florida's history. Then Governor Jed Bush created a commission to look into the laws of 1974 and make recommendations. In 1996, the Commission began a study of local codes that lasted almost two years. What they found was more than 400 different building codes in various jurisdictions throughout the state. A new statewide code would soon emerge. The new statewide code was approved in 2001 and began to be enforced in 2002. The new state building code supersedes any local codes. The Florida Building Code is updated every three years. The Florida Building Commission reviews all amendments and updates. However, it is important to note that it is the Florida Building Code, or FBC, that reigns supreme in the state of Florida. Arizona adopts I-codes, including the International Building Code and International Residential Code. However, local counties are free to amend and update these codes as long as the minimum of the state's adopted codes are met. This is a form of the home rule option for codes. 
We cannot conclude, based on Florida's experience with the Home Rule Code system, that Home Rule is inadequate. It is simply a matter of need and the environment. The Home Rule System of Code works extremely well in Arizona. Massachusetts also adopts the International Building Codes, International Residential Code, and other Model I codes. However, Massachusetts amends these codes at the state level, not the local level, as in the case of Arizona. In Massachusetts, the IRC is amended through 780 CMR 51.00, while the IBC is amended through the Commonwealth of Massachusetts State Building Base Code, currently in its ninth edition. Local jurisdictions are required to meet the state's code. Now, it is important to note that all 50 states adopt the minimum model codes of the IBC, IRC, etc. Even in Florida, which has its own code, they will begin with the Florida Building Code and review I codes and adopt these codes as necessary. States will adopt these codes not only for the purposes of safety and health, but to ensure federal funding for various projects. Now that we understand how states adopt the code, let's look at how they enforce the code. Who is responsible for enforcing building codes? This again varies widely. In most cases, states have put together groups of building officials who are responsible for enforcing the code. This is the case in Massachusetts, where we have state and local regulatory groups enforcing the code. At the state level, we have the Board of Building Regulations and Standards, or BBRS, and at the local level, we have building inspectors. Florida, as previously mentioned, has the Florida Building Commission. This is a group of industry professionals, engineers, architects, contractors, etc., who review the code at the state level. These board members are appointed by the governor. The commission consists of 27 members. At the local level, they have inspectors who are enforcing the code. While in Arizona, code is pushed to the local level for inspections and amendments. At the state level, minimum codes are adopted. As an example, the Arizona Department of Housing adopts codes for manufactured housing, while the state fire marshal adopts the code for fire protection. The state also maintains authority for hospitals, assisted living facilities, etc. All other codes are then passed to the local level for adoption, amendment, and enforcement. Code officials are usually required to go through extensive training to ensure that they understand the code requirements within their local jurisdictions. Now, there are several types of code officials, including building code inspectors, plan examiners, and building code officials. The duties of the officials is to understand the code itself and make any amendments, as in the case of Massachusetts. Inspectors do exactly that. Inspect. They go to project sites and inspect the work to ensure it has been completed according to code. Inspectors can be certified in multiple disciplines, building, plumbing, mechanical, fire, zoning, etc. The inspectors who carry multiple certifications are usually in smaller communities where multiple inspectors are simply not feasible. Plan inspectors review plans to ensure the actual design meets the code. Needless to say, this is going to save a lot of time and money for the contractor if they know in advance that local regulations are not being met. Costly design mistakes can put a company out of business. And again, building code officials oversee this entire process while reviewing the IBC, IRC, amendments, etc. Lastly, many states have training and certification for the constructor themselves. This ensures that those performing the construction have met standard requirements to construct safely. Once again, every state is different. In some states, like Massachusetts, the construction supervisor's license is required. To earn a construction supervisor's license, an individual must pass a three-hour, 75-question exam. Other states may only require an individual attend a class at a predetermined time while other states require only that an individual register as a contractor. Now, in most jurisdictions, such as Massachusetts, it is the pulling of the permit which triggers the code. Once the permit is pulled, the local building inspectors and code officials know that construction is going to be taking place, and they begin the inspection preparation process. 
Many people don't realize that a permit is defined as an application for inspections. The actual forms and applications for permits may vary, but the process remains the same. Once the permit is pulled, the inspections are triggered. Obviously, the amount of inspections and when in the process the work will be inspected depends upon the actual discipline. So, which code is used? The applicable code is usually the one in place when the permit is pulled, though it can vary in some locations. If, for some reason, the code changes during construction, the constructor builds to the code that was in place at the time the permit was pulled. If it is a code that must be updated regardless, most states have an exemption process in place. Also, various time limits are set on the permit. In Massachusetts, construction must begin within 180 days after the permit has been pulled. Also, when inspecting, inspectors must use what is generically known as a red tag. This is because, historically, inspectors would put a red ticket to identify code violations. Today, they may not be red, but the principle is the same. Tags are put on areas where the construction is not code compliant, and typically, instructions to bring the work back to code compliant. The final step in the permit process is the certificate of occupancy. This is to certify that the building has been completed and meets all the local building codes. At this point, the building owner can legally occupy the structure. Now, let's talk about model building codes. To get an idea of model building codes, we should get an idea of their origination. People are often surprised to find out that building codes are not a creation of modern civilization. In fact, the earliest known written law of codes dates back to Babylon, around 1760 BC, under King Hammurabi. These codes contained several specific provisions that related to construction. Though they did not explain how to build, they did explain the consequences of poor construction. As an example, part of the code stated, if a builder builds a house for someone and the house collapses and kills the owner, the builder shall be put to death. King Hammurabi of Babylon, circa 1760 BC. Certainly a solid incentive to do good work. Also in the Bible, Deuteronomy 28 states, in case you build a new house, you must also make parapet for your roof that you may not place blood guilt upon your house because someone might fall from it. Here, just trying to lay a little guilt on you. In colonial America, both George Washington and Thomas Jefferson pushed for the development of building codes. Today, as mentioned earlier, every state in the Union has some form of building codes. Almost all of these codes come from what is known as model codes. Unfortunately, the development of building codes is usually sparked by some form of disaster. In the 1800s, building codes were fairly weak in the United States and rarely, if ever, enforced. Cities were being built very quickly, often with shoddy construction and leaving out key safety features. A series of great disasters later, around the turn of the century, created the push for new and enforceable building codes. As an example, the Boston Building Code of 1873 followed an enormous fire in 1872. The same is true in Chicago, where building codes were quickly adopted after the Great Fire of 1871. The Great Earthquake and Fire of San Francisco in 1906 spurred the Tenement Housing Act of 1909. The act put to an end the poor quality of housing construction which led to many of these buildings going up like matchsticks in the fire. And, of course, the Coconut Grove Fire in Boston on November 28, 1942, drastically changed the fire codes after 492 people were killed. There was also the enormous change in Florida Building Code after Hurricane Andrew, which we've already discussed. And the 1994 Northridge earthquake in California, Hurricane Katrina in New Orleans in 2005, and Superstorm Sandy in New Jersey in 2012 all greatly impacted building codes. The improved building codes that then took place in the 20th century did improve construction and made facilities and housing safer. Unfortunately, almost all the code was locally developed and not coordinated. Also, they were focused only in major cities who had the resources to develop and enforce them. But insurance companies, 
who lost much money in the Great Fires, pushed an organization called the National Board of Fire Examiners to create the first National Building Codes of 1905. The insurance companies made this building code available to jurisdictions around the country who wanted to easily implement a sound code. This code was then amended at annual meetings and updated regularly. As building codes were developed and increased around the nation, so did the building officials industry. At the annual meetings, inspectors and officials discussed changes and best practices within their jurisdictions. These meetings resulted in several regional organizations of building officials. The Southern Building Code Conference International, or SBCCI, was formed in the Southeast. The Building Officials and Code Administrators, or BOCA, became dominant in the Midwest. Pacific Coast Builders Officials Conference became dominant in the West. This organization later became the International Conference of Building Officials, or ICBO. In 1927, the Pacific Coast Building Officials Conference issued a model building code to compete with the National Building Code. This was known as the Uniform Building Code. Soon, other organizations began to issue national model building codes as well. These organizations, SBCCI, BOCA, and ICBO, agreed to merge in 1994 and become the ICC, or International Code Council. However, this organization became formally unified in 2003. ICC now produces a formal series of model codes. So, what is a model code? We can see a patchwork of various codes from around the country created the desire for a uniformed, consistent building code. It also showed that individual organizations, jurisdictions, and so on, creating their own codes was extremely repetitive and wasteful. This was the perfect example of reinventing the wheel. To respond to this, many organizations began to develop model codes. So a model code is not designed for use in a specific location but produced for almost anywhere. Model codes are usually produced by an organization and not a jurisdiction. But a model code can be adopted by a jurisdiction as their building code. It is also worth noting that these model codes have no enforcement of law until adopted by a jurisdiction. Instead of each jurisdiction or city writing their own code, the system allows building officials from around the country to get together, write and update codes. Ideally, these codes are written in public, democratic consensus process where there is transparency and prevention of dominance from one specific group or jurisdiction. So now, let's take a look at the characteristics of a model code. While model codes vary in style, approach, and layout, they generally share several common characteristics. First, they have a clear scope. The scope defines exactly when the code should apply. This includes the kinds of buildings, the kind of work, and the systems covered. As an example, the scope of the International Residential Code is very detailed, and it states, The provisions of the International Residential Code for one- and two-family dwellings shall apply to the construction, alteration, movement, enlargement, placement, repair, equipment use, and occupancy, location, removal, demolition, of detached one- and two-family dwellings and townhouses, not more than three stories above grade plane in height, with a separate means of egress and their accessory structures. As you can see, the scope is very clear as to where this code applies. Also, model codes are written in very clean and unambiguous language. This is because they must be written in a manner in which building officials around the country can understand it and enforce it, within their jurisdiction. As previously mentioned, defined terms are used in model codes. In the ICC, these terms are italicized, which means that there is an established definition for that term in the definitions section of the code. This is key to establishing when certain requirements apply. But requirements never appear within the definition themselves. Next, Model codes avoid permissive language. As an example, model codes will never state what may be done. Permissive language causes confusion about the requirements of what should or should not be done. Model codes reference national consensus standards. 
Building codes cannot establish standards and requirements for each and every material and system used in construction. For that, they reference reputable organizations that do establish standards for materials and systems, such as the American Society of Testing and Materials, or ASTM, the American Society of Mechanical Engineers, or ASME, the American Concrete Institute, or ACI, and many others. Model codes will have a version, year, or number associated with them. Model codes are updated on a standard cycle, which allows jurisdictions to differentiate between versions of the code. So here's an example of a model code from the IBC. When we look at the title, we know that it's from Chapter 14, Exterior Walls. We can also note that it is in Section 3 of Chapter 14 and Subset 5 of Section 3. Exterior walls is italicized, meaning there is a specific definition for exterior walls in Chapter 2. Also, note the word shall throughout the code, leaving no question as to what should be done. Now here, we also see an amendment from Massachusetts. This is because Massachusetts has adopted the code, made an adjustment to the code, or amendment, and it is now legally enforceable in the state of Massachusetts. As you can see, the Massachusetts Amendment is very similar to the model code. But Massachusetts added the phrase, and the flashing of other openings and penetrations. There were also differences in the exceptions. Model codes are developed with the understanding that they may not address the unique needs of every location. For that reason, local jurisdictions have the option of amending or modifying the model code when they adopt them as the local code. Now, while some locations will make no adjustments to the model code, other jurisdictions will amend them and modify them for a variety of reasons. Some reasons include hurricane potential, earthquake potential, flood zone areas, etc. Other reasons might be local available building materials. As an example, New England uses a lot of concrete because we have readily available aggregates. But this is not the case in other parts of the country. Therefore, Massachusetts has an entire section, 780-CMR-110.R1, Concrete Testing Laboratory Licensing, which is unique to Massachusetts. Local amendments can add new provisions or delete provisions from the code. Once a code is amended and adopted by jurisdiction, it becomes the code for that jurisdiction. Once again, in Massachusetts, the code is the adopted I-codes, and the amendments to those codes. And here's a Massachusetts edition. 1801.3, Foundation Types Not Covered by the Code. It states that if a particular soil is considered unsuitable as a bearing capacity soil or has unusual settlement characteristics, the soil can be modified to obtain the appropriate bearing capacity, but a report must be issued by a design professional with all of the appropriate data. So, putting this information together with the building code information we discussed earlier, we see that model building codes provide a mechanism for local jurisdictions to adopt, implement, and update their building codes to provide for the health, safety, and comfort of their citizens. Big takeaway. The building code is for safety, health, and betterment of society. Now, please move on to the quiz. Here, you will have to answer five questions correctly before moving on to the next module. Thank you.